have I got a story for you. So if you remember back in June or July of 2023, I took a French provincial piece and I turned it into a Barbie masterpiece. That's when all the Barbie hype was going around. So I tried my hand at an ombre pink look. And while we all loved the dresser, it really waited for the right person to come along because it was a very unique piece and a bright pink doesn't go with many household decor. So I waited and I waited and I waited and it sat on Facebook Marketplace for about six months and then about a month ago a grandma came along and purchased the dresser for her two-year-old granddaughter which was just so fulfilling and it made me really excited that I waited for the right buyer because they were going through a really rough patch and this two-year-old little girl absolutely loves and adores pink but long story short the grandma reached back out to me after they had purchased the dresser and got it home and they found this on our website and it is a French provincial nightstand because the little toddler is in need of a nightstand but it can't look like this it has to look pink so in this video I am going to take you step by step on exactly how to flip this piece of furniture going over all of the beginner friendly tips that I wish I knew when I started out flipping furniture down below in the description of this video, I have linked my starter kit guide, which will link you to all six products that I think are essential to get started furniture flipping. So the first one is a screwdriver. Now you might already have this laying around the house. So all you've got to do is grab it and remove the hardware. Another tool that would be great to have is a drill, but if you don't have an electric drill, a screwdriver will do just fine to get that hardware off. Next up in the starter kit guide are these white rags and some simple green. And these are perfect for getting your piece cleaned. You need to start out with a fresh, clean surface free of any dust and debris so that you can ensure your paint will adhere to the actual surface and not to those dirt and dust on that dirt and dust on your actual surface. So I like to use the lint free cloths because they're just able to be tossed. You can also use a rag if you have that on hand so you don't have to buy more items. Just douse your piece with your cleaning material. Again, it has to be a degreaser and then wipe everything down. I'll show you in a minute why we clean. I want you to notice that I am starting off with a small piece. If you're just getting started and you're not really sure where to start or how to start, start out by grabbing a small piece. This piece actually came along with a larger dresser that I had done in the past and I didn't really have much that I wanted to do with this piece, but I kept it in my inventory. So you can get small pieces for pretty cheap on places like Facebook Marketplace or thrift stores. It's important to start small because you just need to start by practicing and you don't wanna start on a huge canvas when you're not really sure what you're doing. It's better to start small for practice and then you'll be able to work your way up to those larger pieces. All right, so I'm gonna show you why we clean. This was a clean white rag before and just this small piece had a lot of filth on it. So we need to get all of that off before we begin our sanding because we don't want to grind any of that down into the surface. But now I'm going to show you the next tool on my starter kit guide, which is an orbital sander. We are so excited to finally be launching a really fun idea, a furniture flipping competition. So what we're going to be doing is we want to fly three contestants out to Omaha, Nebraska. We're going to house you. We're going to have you in the shop. We're going to clear this space and we're going to put three people in a friendly, but a competitive uh, environment. The best part, there's going to be a gigantic award 
for the first place winner that will be chosen by three special guest judges that we will not be unveiling just yet. So it's going to cost $1. And what is that $1 gonna get you? It's going to get you access to this episode of this furniture flipping competition. You'll also get the opportunity to apply to be a participant within the furniture flipping challenge contest that we're putting on. So open right now. Check out our Patreon from February 19th to the 29th, I think was a leap year. It's going to be a dollar to get access to this, let's call it a pay-per-view episode. Um, and after that, once March hits, it's gonna go up to $5. So now is the time. The first episode will go out March 30th, Easter weekend. Mark your calendars, yes. Yeah. This is the orbital sander and the disc, the sanding disc and a mask. So I've got a 120 grit sanding paper here and this is just gonna give what's called a scuff sand. We're gonna give our surface a little bit of tooth so that the paint can really grip on. Now, I wanna say that, you know, you don't necessarily 100% need an orbital sander but it's going to make the job a lot more simple. When you are sanding, you could take the sandpaper and just use your hand and go across the whole surface. It's gonna take you a bit longer to do that. And to save time, I always like to just grab an orbital sander. There's a beginner orbital sander, and then there's a couple that you know can get a little bit more pricey, but it's also gonna help cut down on the time spent when sanding. So you just line up the holes with the orbital sander here and everything just velcros on. A 120 grit is great for scuff sanding. So I like to put a mask on and then we're just gonna turn our sander on and go across the entire surface, just making sure that we're really roughening it up because right now it's really smooth and the paint doesn't have anything to grip onto. So sometimes with the orbital sander, you have some curved parts and you may have to use just sandpaper for those curved parts because it could be a little bit difficult. As you continue on your journey of flipping furniture though, there are different tools that can help you get around um, the curves a little bit better without compromising the shape of everything. And those are with some foam abrasive pads that you can attach onto your sander and that will really help you get around those curves. For now, I'll just show you that you can take your sandpaper off of your orbital sander and get into those curves with your hand. All right, sanding is complete and I just have a damp rag now and I'm gonna just wipe down the surface because since we sanded it created a lot of dust and we don't want that again under our paint so we're going to wipe all that back. Basically what we're doing all before we get to paint is to prep to put the paint on. Prep is key. If you don't prep your piece well, you're not going to have a piece that lasts long into the future. The paint finish is gonna be wonky, just not gonna be the best quality. So although prep is not the most fun, it is the most necessary. So now as I rub my hand across the top of the surface, I'm feeling a lot more of a rough surface, which means the paint can adhere, which now it is time to paint. All right, so let's talk paint brushes and paint. I really think that it's important to have a high quality brush that you are using so that you can just kind of eliminate what's called brush stroke marks, just kind of some texture that you can tell something was painted on. Using a higher quality synthetic brush like a zebra brush is gonna help eliminate those a lot. So that's what I recommend for starters. And then second, I recommend an all-in-one paint for beginners. This way you don't need to worry about priming your piece 
so, so that it'll bond really well to your piece. And then also you don't need to worry about top coating it. Sometimes those steps can be really frustrating. And so to start out, it's great to start with an all-in-one paint. That means the primer, the paint, and the top coat are all built into one formula. So when you're painting a piece of furniture, it's important to keep a wet edge on the edge of your brush, which just basically means you don't wanna be dragging too little amounts of paint across your surface, or that's gonna really cause it to dry way too fast. Uh, but then on the contrary, you don't wanna have too much paint because that'll cause little uh, drips potentially, or just clumps of too much paint, which will just not lead to a great finish either. So it's kind of a happy medium between them and you'll get the hang of it the more practice you give to painting furniture. So I like to start by just dabbing my paint into, or my paint brush into my paint. And yes, there will be mistakes made, like me. I'm a big klutz, so that can happen. But anyway, I like to dab a little bit, and then I like to start in the middle of my piece and just lightly feather out my paint. So I'm not pushing too hard, I'm not going too fast or too slow, and I'm just making sure that I am going with long, big brush stroke marks from all the way side to side like so. And I'm just gonna do that until I fill up the entire top here. Again, just little small amounts of paint. You can always grab more. It's kind of harder to get less paint once you've already got it on to your paintbrush. Just continue to feather it out. And then on my last stroke across, I'm gonna go from side to side completely so that I don't see any start-stop marks. So like I said, I am doing this piece to match a, another piece that I did for someone who purchased the Barbie piece of furniture. And so this is obviously a really bright piece of furniture, a really bright pink called Prickly Pear. And um, I wanna talk about colors a little bit for beginners because sometimes we can overthink the colors that we choose for our furniture. Now, would I typically choose a bright pink piece as a beginner piece or to sell in my market? No, I would not from experience, but it's not something um, that is a wrong thing to choose. When you're choosing colors, just don't overthink it. Think about your market, think about what could potentially sell a little bit faster than other things. And depending on how much space you have, how much you want things to sell, and how quickly you want them to sell, let that be kind of the determining factor of what color you choose your piece to be could go more neutral or more bold, like a bright pink color. When you get around different edges, you're just gonna wanna be really careful that you're not getting too much paint to cause dripping because that is the most common area that you'll see the drips is where things come to an edge or a corner. So just really be careful and watch out for those areas. So after you've done coat number one, you gotta let it dry for probably about an hour or so, and then we can come back for a second coat. All right, it's time for coat two. I'm putting this thing on a table so that it's a little easier for me to get to, so I don't have to bend over. And we're just gonna do coat number two exactly like we did coat number one. That's what I love about flipping furniture is a lot of the steps are repeatable through like project to project. So once we've got that first coat on, 
to let it dry, and then coat number two is the same thing. Between coats, you can either put your brush in a Ziploc bag, or you can wash it out between coats if you want to. It just totally depends. I do both, so there's really no right or wrong. As long as you wash it out at the end of your project, then you'll all be good. All right, so that does it for coat two. And so depending on the color of paint you use and what the pigmentation is will kind of depend on how many coats you need. So for sure, you're always gonna do two coats, but sometimes you might need to do three. And with this one, I'm definitely not quite getting full coverage yet. So I will need to come back and do a coat number three. All right, coat three, here we come. This time I put my brush in a plastic bag. All right, I believe that that is the last coat that we'll need. So we're gonna let it dry and come back and check to make sure that we've got full coverage from coat number three. So it looks like that third coat really finished off this piece and it's looking great. A bit bright for my eyes, but I think that the little toddler is going to absolutely love it. There's just one more thing that we've got to do, which is to put the piece of hardware back on. Uh, for this one, all I did was updated the piece of hardware with some gilding wax and I'll link that down below. That's not a part of the starting kit, but one of the easiest things to do when you're a beginner with furniture flipping is to change out the hardware or to update the existing hardware. That can really change a look of an entire piece of furniture. Hardware is like the jewelry of furniture, so it's really important that you pay attention to what looks great with the final piece of furniture. So I just updated it so that it's a little bit less uh, two-toned and made it into just one bronze color. And this is also going to match the Barbie piece that I had done that is also gonna be in her room. And then all I'm gonna do is utilize the same screwdriver that I did at the beginning to screw these back in. And we're done. I always like to finish off my pieces by putting them by a staging wall because typically I am selling them for a profit. So staging doesn't have to be so elaborate and over the top, but you just wanna make sure that when you're taking the photos, someone that sees the photos and is poten a potential buyer can really imagine the piece in their own home. The whole purpose of staging is so that people can get that glimpse because not not everyone can see this piece of furniture in their own home unless you give them a great backdrop. You wanna avoid things around the area that could get into the photo to make it feel a little bit more cluttered. And you just want it to all be very cohesive with great lighting when you are taking the photos. So also we, are, we typically sell pieces for profit. So for this piece, I wanna talk about my profit just a little bit. And I want to encourage you that not all pieces have to be a home run on as, or as far as profit goes. When you're starting out, you're going to get some, low, some lower profits, but as you continue to build up your skill and your expertise level and the more tools you invest in, the higher you're going to be able to price your items. So for example, this piece right here was a very beginner level piece and it was a small piece I got it with another piece of furniture so I wasn't looking to make such a high profit off of it and when the person reached out saying that her granddaughter wanted a nightstand to go with the matching dresser I priced it at $100 and after paint and supplies we're only in around $30 and that includes
includes the entire can of paint. But if you guys remember, I only used about a quarter of it. So really I have an entire project or two projects that I can get out of that same can of paint. So even if we counted the entire can of paint on this project, we're still getting a total profit of $70 for really not a long time or not a lot of time that was put into this piece. So I just want to encourage you to start small, start building up your skill level uh, when it comes to furniture flipping. And the more you get into it, the higher profits will be as the time goes. And don't forget to grab our starter kit down below in the description that has six of the most important tools that you are going to need to get your foot in the door when it comes to flipping furniture. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you on the flip side.